Well, hey, thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, my name is Christopher Newland, and today I'm going to be talking to you about how we migrated a large Fortune 100 company to Kubernetes in seven months. So just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a consultant with Red Hat. Uh, I've been there for about four years now. Um, my specialties are in migration, specifically for Fortune 100 companies. So we're usually dealing with migrations of at least what would end up being 1,000 to even potentially 5,000 namespaces. Um, so usually significantly large migrations. Um, I've been involved in the container space for 15 years. Uh, I started in college doing research around OpenVZ that then spun out into a company that I started right out of college that worked with the Department of Energy on containerizing simulations for the Titan supercomputer uh, in the United States. So after that, I um, worked primarily on microservices. And then since then, I've been with Red Hat and have specialized mostly in the migration space, some recently in the edge space. Um, in the last year, I've become one of the main speakers for the Conveyor community. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about Conveyor and some of the technologies um, here today. So just a quick overview, uh, we'll be talking about this specific use case um, in detail, and then we'll be talking about some of the technologies that we used at the time, and how those technologies have evolved to be part of the conveyor community and what the community is about, and also some of the lessons learned and best practices here in 2022. So a little bit about this company. Uh, it's a major healthcare company in the United States, Fortune 100. Um, it's a conglomerate of over 20 companies that formed to make this company. Um, and the, uh, the IT budget, <laughs> I remember the first day I got there, um, the, when people were talking about money, everything was in the millions, multi-millions. And I, I just had to ask someone, so what is your IT budget? And one of the VPs looked at me, he's like, Roughly about a billion. I'm like, oh, all right. That gives me an idea of what I'm dealing with. <laughs> um, and they also have a large overseas presence. So most of their IT staff are located in India with companies like IBM, which is now the Kindrel, what, what was IBM, now Kindrel, um, and companies like Accenture. So a lot of overseas presence, a lot of overseas developers. So the migration first started with a Mesosphere component. Um, this company needed to get off of DCOS within seven months. They had a contract with them that was expiring, and it would end up being a multi-million dollar um, issue if they weren't going to get off within that timeline. So there was a strict deadline that we were under. Uh, we had started piloting OpenShift 3.11 with them about a year prior. So we had about 50 or so namespaces that had existed on the 3.11 cluster. And we were also helping them spin off some EKS instances at the time. So we were going for a full hybrid cloud architecture for both on-premise and cloud-based, where OpenShift was the primary on-prem and the EKS was going to be the primary for cloud-based. Um, most of their applications were uncontainerized at the time. So they had done about 150 in DCOS that were in production and about 300 that were in non-production. And um, great, there we go. There we go. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm getting some feedback. No, you're good. All right, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, about 300 applications that were non-prod, 150 that were in prod. The discrepancy between the two were because a lot of the applications that were running in non-prod were actually sandboxes where that they were attempting to migrate many of these applications. So we were dealing with kind of a, a crazy environment at the time. Um, one of the big things with this too was that they were using the Netflix stack in DCOS. So if you're not familiar with that, that's Zool and Eureka. 
mainly around service discover, discovery and inner um, service communication. So after talking with them, we identified three different types of migrations. The first was the DCOS one, which I pretty much described um, just now. The second one was a Kubernetes to Kubernetes migration. So that would be the OpenShift 3.11 instance that we piloted with them. They wanted to get off of 3.11 and get on the newer OpenShift 4. And they also wanted to migrate those same applications into EKS as well. So we had a full hybrid cloud migration going on from that initial on-premise pilot. And the third was all the uncontainerized applications that they wanted to bring over as well during this time. So primarily Java applications. And um, like I said, the, this is probably the majority of the applications that they had. Go over some of the challenges. Uh, one of the big things we had to do initially was just getting buy-in from their application team. So these are the end users that would be consuming the clusters once deployed. Uh, a lot of them had a very much a, a throw over the fence mentality towards development, especially with how they've been working prior to moving into Kubernetes. Um, so one of the things that I like to stress with Kubernetes is that it is an ecosystem. It's not just an operating, it's not an operating system. And it needs to be treated as such to get full utilization. And a lot of that comes with principles like DevOps and GitOps that when used those methodologies allows you to drive those technologies. Um, and then just making sure to train those teams on basic KS core principles, Kubernetes, you know, what is a deployment, you know, such, such things like that. And um, one of the things that came out during this time, and I want to highlight this, uh, always make sure you're involving security teams <laughs> when you're doing migrations. Um, they had not been involved with the DCOS component. And so I said, hey, I think we should talk to your security team about some of these. And we had two major things come up during that time, which was um, all their containers were running as root on DCOS. And then they were also terminating at their load balancer instead of passing through to the actual um, containers. So those were two other things we had to tackle while, um, while working on this migration. I'll talk a little bit about the high level approach for our migrations. Um, so this um, is actually on conveyor.io. So this is um, not just me. This is actually part of what we've developed as a community. And um, these are the five steps that, um, uh, especially when you're talking to like a project manager, business analyst, director, these are the type of steps that we like to talk to with them. A very high level overview. And this is bigger than these for a reason. I cannot stress enough spend as much time as possible in the assessment phase in a migration. If, if you rush this, all these other ones are gonna fail because this is where you're gonna find out what you're having to tackle and how you're going to group those up, which I'll talk a little bit more here in a moment. This is where um, I was talking about grouping. This is where I I've coined the phrase, the bucket approach. Talk about that here in a moment. And then I'll show this here as well. So the, the approach that I, the terminology I use within Red Hat with my clients is what I like to call the bucket approach to migrations. This is a little bit different than how I find companies want to naturally do things. Usually it's based off of, I've even had clients say alphabetical. They just want to go alphabetical on the migration or they want to go with the sales team first and then over here. And I like to try to take a bit of a different approach to migrations. And I found that the migrations that have taken this approach have been maybe 30 to 40% more efficient. And I'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. But the bucket approach for me is always com finding common patterns, common integrations, and common domains. Um, making sure to group up applications that are similar. So if you have a group of applications that are running off of, let's say, Django, and they're all stateless, or excuse me, stateful in that case, then that would be one of your buckets. And it doesn't matter if one's over here, one's over there. Like, you want to make sure that you're grouping it up from, from what are 
most alike because these are the patterns that you're going to figure out. And then you're going to be able to do all of these in one bucket from a migration perspective. It moves a lot faster when you're not having to switch between these constantly. Focus on a particular domain, technology domain, and focus your migration around that. Um, I have had challenge getting buy-in from companies on this, but once I've shown them the results, they've always fallen in line on this. Because um, a lot, like I said, a lot of times they want to start with a particular business unit, but once we sell them on this, we've, we've shown some pretty significant results on it. This is the five steps. So this is more towards your, your people who are executing on the migration, specific to Kubernetes. I like to take a, a five-step approach for that as well. Um, I always start with images first because that's going to be the basis for everything. You have to have the image before you can really do, really deploy anything. Um, in this case of this migration, we just wrote our own scripts to do this, but um, there are some tools out there um, that can speed this up as well. I then like to take things from a cluster level perspective. So um, the namespace, things like quotas and network policies, anything that we manage by a cluster administrator or um, as a cluster level resource, I like to get those out of the way first because it can identify problems that you're gonna face with these three. The third step, and probably the most problematic if you're, you are know, have a stateful migration, is always gonna be your volumes. Um, this is where I always try to have people who can champion for the particular client in the area of their storage, because yeah, this is where there's a lot of complexities here. I could have a whole session just on this. Um, but um, you want to have this happen before this, and even preferably this. There's a bit of a chicken before the egg problem sometimes between these two, but I find this one works better. For security, I like to focus on your RBAC policies, access controls, things of that, that nature. And that then makes sure that by the time that you're ready to actually deploy your manifests, that you, know, you have a high level of confidence that all these foundational pieces will allow your application to deploy in the first time. Hopefully, fingers crossed. And then these are the type of, like I said, you, know, you have your cluster managed objects, persistent data, um, secrets, manifests, and so forth. So going back to those three types for this particular use case, um, for type one, um, we, like I said, we started by migrating the images to a Quay repository that was located on-prem on the OpenShift 4 instance. And then we were generating the initial KAS resources using templates. So we were using a combination of Helm and OpenShift templates. Um, but one thing I wanna highlight, at that time, this was not available. So definitely check out Move to Cube. Move the Cube is a um, part of the conveyor community, and you just point it towards your application, and it'll actually generate these initial resources for you. That's very helpful because the way we targeted this migration was using Argo CD and GitOps. So we would export those resources, put them into Git, and that's actually how we would execute at least that portion where we had the, the diagram, how we executed on the resource part of that migration. Um, this part was pretty easy, and we, let, we just made some documentation for application teams to remove it, and then um, similar with this requirement too. We, we let the application teams drive these two and gave them just the blueprints. Type two for Kubernetes to Kubernetes. Uh, we also used Argo CD in this case, very similar to the first slide. Um, from a storage perspective though, we used uh, the Rustic operator. This has now been incorporated into Crane. Crane is another one of the projects of the conveyor community, and it's specifically designed to, to migrate from, a, from one Kubernetes instance to another. Doesn't matter what type it is, if it's OpenShift, if it's Rancher, um, EKS, JKS, it's been designed to go between any type of Kubernetes. Uh, we did this at a namespace level. Um, we also put a load balancer 
in front of the OpenShift 311. And every time we finished a migration, we would cut that over from that load balancer sitting in front. So it would split the traffic from, by, by namespace. This took about two hours of downtime. So I wanted to highlight this because this is an improvement that's been made. Um, and mainly because of the storage component side of that where um, we didn't want to deal with data drift or anything you know, involving that. Um, but if you use Crane now, Crane has a lot of functionalities where you can stage the migration in place. You don't have to bring anything down. So all you have to figure out is how you're going to do that cut over and switch your traffic from one location to the other. But Crane will do that very, very effectively for you. So this is, like I said, the part of the conveyor, one of the conveyor projects um, in the com conveyor community. The type three was a combination of greenfield applications and applications that were legacy or pre-existing. Most of them were on Java WebSphere for us. Um, and there was, a, there was actually a few hundred of these while we were there. So this was a pretty major effort. And um, the big ask that we had from the client was to define the cloud readiness for each of these applications. We were using a tool called Pathfinder at the time. This was a Red Hat tool that has since been ad adapted to the conveyor community as a product called Tackle. Tackle will do an analysis of an existing application and give you like a rating of how ready is it to be a cloud native application. It'll also give you remediation advice as well. So a really cool tool. One thing that we weren't expecting was that um, the client also wanted to get off of Liberty from their web sphere. So we also moved them over to a base image for JWS Tomcat. Uh, this ended up having a massive cost savings element since this is an, one, one of Red Hat's open source images. So free, free to them. And then um, the containerization was mainly led by the application teams. Most of these were overseas application teams and we just enabled them through some workshops to handle that migration. Ultimately, they were going to be responsible for that. The accomplishments, we did get off of DCOS. We got off in eight months. Um, they did extend it for one month, but we were actually finished within the seven month time frame. Um, what ended up happening, and this is, um, this is something that I've, I've since learned to ask all my clients. There was a DR server that we weren't aware of that we needed to move things, actually they needed to move things over to, it wasn't part of our migration. Um, so always make sure you're asking about your DR when you're doing migrations as well. Um, like I said, we, we containerized over 100 services in parallel, so this was driven by their application teams. And um, we also got them off of Docker Container Registry into Quay on the OpenShift for on-premise. They were also using Bamboo at the time, and um, a separate team, Red Hat team, moved them over to Jenkins within that year as well. So this was a major cost savings as well, since this was uh, an open source version of Jenkins that they were using. And then um, we planted the seeds of DevOps. I like to say that a lot. I wouldn't say we got them there because that's something that takes a lot of time, but our team definitely planted a lot of the seeds. And even since I've left there a couple years ago, they've adapted their DevOps practices significantly. The shortcomings, um, we did have a lot of the overseas teams that um, really struggled in taking ownership of this process, um, treating Kubernetes as an ecosystem. Um, thankfully, we had buy-in from their leadership, so we were able to put pressure there. But um, that's one area, if you don't have that type of buy-in, you can have some real issues, especially if you're on the consulting side of things. Um, this could be a real problem if, if you don't have that buy-in. Um, some application teams, like I said, were unwilling to then take ownership also for the DevOps and GitOps perspective. Um, thankfully, I would say about 80, 90% were good with it, but we did have some, some ones that we had to do a little more hand-holding on. Um, we did have some challenges too with them being enabled on Kubernetes. Uh, this is just because of the nature of it being a seven month migration. I would recommend if, if, if I had to pick a timing, I think they should have at least done a year because they, once they got over to Kubernetes, they didn't know how to take ownership of it. 
So there was some hand-holding from that perspective as well, where we had to teach them what is, what is a deployment, what is a secret. Um, since we didn't have that opportunity up front, there was a lot of education going on. Uh, one issue, too, we ran into was just logging. I'm, sh I'm sure we've all faced this with Kubernetes. Um, thankfully, they, they made the decision to just then forward to their Splunk instance. So that was something that we had to identify um, mid-migration. And then the manual lift and shift uh, of DCOS. So this is where uh, Move to Cube comes into play now. We were doing this through Helm and manually copying things over. Um, now something like Move to Cube can do that for you where it generates those manifests. This is just outlining those different products I mentioned. Um, I'll talk about forklift here in a minute. It's the only one that we haven't talked about. Move to Cube, we've talked about Tackle for like an analysis and then Crane for, for the Kubernetes to Kubernetes. And this is more about metrics-driven transformation. So I'm not talking about that today, but just know Polaris is also part of the um, conveyor community. So let's talk about some trends that we're seeing today. I would say the biggest thing that I'm talking about with my clients is container-native virtualization. This is something that's coming up nearly on a daily basis for me. Um, there, are, there are organizations that want to move all their VMs over, and there's some that want to bring over some legacy snowflakes that they just recognize are going to be too challenging to containerize and would instead like to just bring it over so that it exists within the Kubernetes ecosystem and its networking and storaging components. This is where forklift comes into play. If you're using VMware, if you're using Red Hat virtualization, um, KV KVM, you can just actually <laughs> lift and shift using this tool, and it'll help you do that. I know we're expanding it to include some other hypervisors. I'm not sure what those are right now, but I know this is growing right now. Um, and then, like I said, just a focus into hybrid cloud. Um, the big theme I'm seeing in the last couple of years, now that Kubernetes has been maturing, is more and more people want to bring their own flavor, um, kind of bring your own cluster, especially with these larger companies. So a lot of the people I'm working with right now have JKS, um, EKS, OpenShift, Rancher, multiple flavors that exist within their entire organization. And um, the good part about that is that Kubernetes is built with that in mind. So that's one of the beauties here, especially from a migration standpoint, these tools don't really care about what, you know, what, your, um, what your source is. Um, from, a management, from a cluster management perspective, though, it definitely adds some complexities. And then just going to the edge. So a lot of these companies I've worked with are coming back to me and saying, hey, Chris, we've gotten this all set up. We're feeling enabled and empowered. Our people now want to move from our data centers, get into our factories and our on-site locations, our stores. How do we do that from a migration perspective? So these are conversations I'm having right now with a lot of my clientele. If you're interested, um, we also have a report on conveyor.io about um, application modernization in 2022. So there's a lot of information here on the trends I was just talking about and then some of the challenges more in depth of what I've been talking about today. But that's a really good resource if you're willing to learn more. And that's all. Thank you.